Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Overeaters Anonymous 100 Pounder Special Focus Meeting. It, today is Wednesday, the 22nd of September, 2021. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Maggie G. Maggie is from Colorado and she joined away in January 2017. And she is here to explain her experience, strength and hope. Take it away, Maggie. Thanks a lot, Rita. Um, hey, everybody. Um, like, like Rita said, uh, my name is Maggie G. Um, I um, found out about OA when I, uh, after I moved to Colorado, I grew up in uh, the Detroit area of Michigan. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I just wanted to come and share my experience, strength and hope. Um, and Rita was kind enough to, to ask me and uh, you guys were nice enough to have me. So thank you. Um, and it's funny, um, you know, I, I, I really don't find myself getting nervous talking um, in, in these meetings because I know just like any aspect of life now, all I have is my experience. It doesn't mean that it's somebody else's experience. It doesn't mean that it's absolute truth. It's just what I know to be true. Um, so yeah, what it was like. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't remember a time I, when food wasn't the focus or, or the main goal or obsession in my life, um, even from a really young age. Life was confusing, life was always baffling uh, and my emotions were overwhelming. And I always turned to food to escape. It, it was my only solution um, and it worked great. It, it was this way for me to, you know, I called it going dark. It's like when a shark's eyes roll back and you just see that dark. It, it, it was that moment where I didn't have to exist and didn't have to be baffled and, and overwhelmed by life. And it really did work fantastic until it started to kill me. Um, through, throughout grade school, middle school, high school, um, you know, primary school for me, um, I had people who loved me and plenty of people who loved me and they were worried for my health. Uh, I grew into adulthood feeling morally deficient. Like I genuinely thought there was something lacking in, in me that other people could control their food. Why couldn't I? There was just something terrible about me. And that's exactly how I felt. Um, because I couldn't be better. And, and I, I hoped for it. I hoped to be better with, with everything I had, but I felt lost and, and helpless to change my course. Um, in adulthood, I, I fell in love with my best friend. Um, you know, even keeping God at an arm's length, I had a frank discussion with God where I said, if I'm supposed to be with somebody, you're gonna have to make it really clear. And he did. Even when I was limiting God, God had my back. Always did. Always. So love, I was in love. That was the answer. That was what was going to change life for me. Now that I had somebody in my life, it would be the catalyst to let me change. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, my partner moved from Detroit where we met to Colorado where he grew up. Um, after about a year of living separately, um, he asked me to, um, and again, I was convinced this was it. This was what was going to change life for me. This was what was going to change me. <laughs> a change of location. That was gonna make all the difference. I was, I was going to be a new invented person 
who can control for the first time food. No, absolutely not. You know, that fresh start where I thought I could reinvent myself and be, be a better and a, and a healthier me. No, um, because no matter how far I, I moved or traveled, no matter how much different aspects of my life changed, I was still there. No matter how fast or how far I go, I'm still there. So trying to change the outside, trying to outline myself, it just doesn't work. And, and there was no way to find enough external validation to, to quiet that, that vicious voice in my head, the one that can cut me to the bone quicker than anybody else can. It was that, that voice that constantly told me how worthless I was. That was never quiet. And so my disease just got worse and worse. Um, and I, I lied and I hid and I stole in service of my addiction. There was nobody and no thing that was more important to me than my obsession, than my addiction. There was nothing I could put above it. Um, and so that, that continued feeling of a moral failing, it, it continued to grow and, and overwhelm me. And I spent my energy desperately trying to be the ist the nicest, the friendliest, the most helpful, the most caring, the most giving, the most self-sacrificing, the most easygoing, the most unbothered. I tried so hard to put on this external person that I desperately wanted to be. And I had to be the best at all of these different aspects to, to hide this terrible person I knew myself to be or I believed myself to be. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of a shopping cart with one wheel that spins like crazy, but never touches the ground. I was spending so much energy because I was so desperate to be validated. But again, no matter how grateful or appreciative people were when I would turn my life upside down, I would twist myself into knots, making life t a tiny bit more convenient for, for somebody, a casual acquaintance, a friend, anybody. But no matter how grateful they were for, for my doing this, and honestly, it was this thing they never asked me to do. It was just something I'm like, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll be the best. Um, but that, that gratitude was never enough. It was never enough to quiet that, that cruel voice. Um, and so I dove deeper into my disease, slowly killing myself because uh, I had no other answer. You know, that, that's something that always stood out to me in Bill's story, um, how uh, when the market crashed um, and people leapt to their death right? at that time in his life, how, how judgmental he was of people who took their own life. Um, but that's what my disease was when I was living in it. It was a slow suicide. So it changed. Um, towards the end of 2016, my partner uh, suggested that I try an OA meeting. He um, had spoke, I'm sure he was incredibly worried about me and my health. Um, and he spoke to his um, psychiatrist about it and she had suggested OA. Um, and he explained to me 
that he was with me no matter what. But he wanted the time that we had together to, to be longer than the trajectory that I was on. So in January of 2017, I tried to find every excuse why I just couldn't make it to a meeting. Um, oh, I was so busy at work. I was, oh, the roads are terrible. But in January 2017, I uh, went to an OA meeting. Um, I, I went to this meeting with the goal of appeasing my partner, of quieting his worry so that I could get back to my binges, so that I could get back to serving my disease. 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, that, that was the only thing that I saw going to that meeting. Uh, instead of at that meeting, I found my truth. You know, I, I really had believed I, I was the only one who struggled with this overwhelming urge. I had no idea that this was a disease, that this was an addiction. Um, I thought I was alone in this world. But at this meeting, I, I found I was no longer alone. At this meeting, I had people read a story, a story that could have just as soon have been mine. It was so easy to identify in with Bill's experience. It, it, it was this huge relief and it was also an oh shit moment of, of this is exactly who I am. I am an addict. And I continued going back to meetings for months, taking small steps to be of service, still trying to convince others of how great I was. Um, but changing nothing else in life. I would still binge, still stop for fast food on my way home from a meeting. Um, that spring, I started working with a sponsor. I stopped binging, or I stopped having significant binges. Um, but this first, this first time we're working the steps, it was so much in my own will. I decided what my red, yellow, green like foods were. I decided the pace and the thoughtlessness of how the steps were worked. And that, that pace, that, that, that was a nice slow pace. Thank you very much. Um, when I took step one, it was with the attitude of, all right, I'm going to admit this one time and one time only that I am powerless. You get one time. Um, this first time working the steps, this was full of self-will run riot and I had no room for a higher power. I had no want of a higher power and I had no room for it. Um, and so in my own self-will, I decided that losing weight was equal to success in program. So I was doing great. I was a huge success. So what if I started having small binges when I was alone in the house? I mean, they, they weren't the crazed, painful binges of my past, so I was recovering. After, uh, uh, gosh, probably about half a year. After about half a year, I started working step four and it was so scary. And because of that, my action went nowhere because of me deciding how the pace of this and how this should look and how this should go, it went nowhere. And eventually my sponsor kindly and gent gently pointed out that this wasn't benefiting me and broke up with me, understandably. I saw this as yet another failure, as yet another way I tried to fix this malady and, and I failed. Uh, because of a job and home lo location change, I started going to different meetings. 
But that fear of failure, that fear of falling short again, it kept me out of recovery for another year and a half. And I feel like this is something that perhaps a lot of people hold is if we're not completely flawless in our recovery, if we don't make it through the steps the first time, if we relapse, then we've, we, we've failed. And I, I don't think that's true. I think this is just, if this happens, this is just part of our story. This is just part of our experience. But because of that fear, I, I lived in my disease. I lived in that confusion and that fear and that loneliness for another year and a half. And I convinced myself that once life settled down, once work wasn't so crazy, once I could have time to truly devote myself to the program, I would get another sponsor. Again, it is that, that self-will. And honestly, thank God for service. I'm so grateful that even though I, I, I was completely lost, I kept volunteering at meetings and at inner group, and that kept me coming back. I, I could have easily disappeared and walked away from OA. Um, and I know that if I had at that point left OA, I wouldn't be alive. Um, this disease, as I said, is a slow suicide and it had me beat. Uh, so my turning point, uh, there was a Northern Colorado conference in the beginning of October in 2019. Uh, and it was the first conference I'd ever been to. Um, and that first night I, I was surrounded by people who had figured out how to manage life, had seemingly figured out how to handle recovery and life and, and, and all of it. And I remember thinking, these people have lives just as busy and full and chaotic as me. How did they find recovery? And I can't. I felt so lost. And I sat down in the middle of this, th this gathering and started writing because I still held on to that, that idea that self-knowledge and understanding, that would pull me out. If I could understand this enough, if I could will myself, to get it, and that was what would fix me. Uh, a, a woman from my meeting, she, she saw me writing and crying and asked if I was all right. I smiled, which by the way, crying and smiling at the same time, it looks real crazy, uh, and said, yeah, of course I'm good, because that's, that's the only response I knew how to have, and she, thankfully called bullshit um and huh? so it's March night um and so I asked if she knew anyone who was willing to work with me and she she said she'd been waiting right there oh for the last year and a half and so that evening was the first day of my sobriety Um, and this, the, this time working the steps looks so different. Um, one of the biggest differences was I was no longer looking for a loophole or a way out or an excuse of going back to my disease. Um, and the biggest change was that I had been given the gift of des desperation. And it, it's so funny that this is something that I wholeheartedly hope for other people that they may be given this gift of desperation. Um, but it's exactly what I needed and it's where I needed to be, to be completely out of ideas and out of options. That was the only place I could start and have any, any chance of not being ruled by self-will. And I was an absolute doubting Thomas. I, I didn't believe 
that I could ever have the freedom and the recovery that I saw. And I doubted the ability to make my own food for a week in order to, to keep my alcoholic ingredients out of my body and, and to stop that allergy and this obsession loop. I, I, I honestly thought, okay, I can do this for one week, maybe two weeks tops, but there's no way that this is a long-term thing that I can do. Um, I doubted I would be able to face my actual self rather than the one I made up in my mind. The self that had resentments ready in my mind, the one that was petty and judgy and angry. I had a million doubts and reasons to why this wouldn't work for me. That, that, that terminal uniqueness. 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, but that desperation, it allowed me to put my head down and do the work, allowed, allowed me to be led. And if I hadn't been out of ideas, I know I would still be trying to hold on to my alcoholic foods that I've let go of and, and struggling for basic day-to-day -day sobriety. If not for that desperation, I would still be trying to manipulate my life and my recovery. I would still be trying to hold on to my old life, my old self, all the while expecting a radical change. Um, so what it's like now. <sighs> Life is bigger than I ever thought it could be. Um, it's full of flaws and, and shortcomings, but it's big and vibrant and beautiful. And it's filled with my imperfection. And it's amazing how I can exist in my own skin. And for the first time, be comfortable in that. To, to not have to fight so hard to look flawless. but to to openly accept that I am perfectly flawed that I am a child of my higher power that I am beloved and to truly believe that for the first time to learn over and over that I can't control life. I can't control my life. I can't control anybody else's life. And to continue to accept that allows me to be open to, instead of what I think life should be and what I think should happen in my life and everybody else's life, to be open to the brilliant possibilities that my higher power creates, to be open to that space of going into situations with a heart full of love and compassion and acceptance and, and seeking a true understanding rather than wanting to assert my understanding and my will. And that abundance of love and compassion, that doesn't come from me. That comes from my higher power. That comes from the source of abundant kindness, more than I could ever find within myself. It's kindness for myself its kindness for others around me. I, I, I no longer spend all my time and energy pretending to be anything more than I am. I'm no longer carrying around my shame and my secret and trying to hide 
anything. Uh, I no longer am chained to my disease. That is, I, I honestly thought recovery would look like holding my breath, longing for the foods I could no longer have and stuffing down my resentments for the rest of my life. That's what I thought recovery would be. And it's not, it's not like that at all. Food, it doesn't have that emotional attachment anymore. Food is just what I use to fuel my body. And it, it, it's not a way to escape because I don't need to escape life anymore. Because instead of sitting on the sidelines waiting to die, I'm in life. I, I am full of life and I'm in the middle of it in a way I don't know if I've ever been before. I'm embracing what might be. And sometimes I fall flat on my face and sometimes I don't. But either way, I don't have to pretend anymore. I can be exactly who I am, the person I was created to be. And I am free on a daily basis. That idea of just for today, it, it, it turned into just for today, I again have the chance to continue in this life of recovery. And it's not arrogant and it's not boastful. It's, it's knowing that each day is a continued opportunity to live a life that's been pulled out of the deepest darkness, the deepest loneliness and sadness. This recovery has pulled me out of a life that was guaranteed to end short. and full of confusion and struggle. And instead I can, I can be present for my best friend. I can face anything about myself. And I don't find life so completely overwhelming and baffling because I'm able to face life on life's terms rather than trying to force it into what I think it should be. And for me, this recovery has come from my higher power. Um, I'm so grateful to have a foundation of knowing my true value, knowing that there's a being that is stronger and wiser and more loving than me, that loves me wildly. And that roots my foundation, not in other people's opinions, not in my opinion of myself, but in this sturdy and steadfast love. And for the first time, I have a power that I can turn to for wisdom, that I can run to for comfort and strength. And that given the chance, I can allow to give me this continued life of recovery 
I'm the one who's responsible for putting the time and the effort and the work into it. But my higher power is the one that, that allows me to, to stay in this brilliant life I've discovered outside of my disease. To continue this revolutionary changed life on a daily basis by giving up what I know doesn't work, my will, um, and putting my footsteps in the path of recovery. Thanks. 30 minutes, perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Maggie J. If we can all give her a big round of applause. I'm just gonna read a chapter uh, bit out of the big book now. I always ask for something when a speaker comes. Page 251, The Man Who Mastered Fear. Finally, and I shall never know how much later it was, one clear thought came to me. Try prayer, you can't lose. And maybe God will help you, just maybe, mind you. Having no one else to turn to, I was willing to give him a chance, although with considerable doubt. I got down on my knees for the first time in 30 years. The prayer I said was simple, it went something like this. God, for 18 years, I've been unable to handle this problem. Please let me turn it over to you. Immediately, a great feeling of peace descended upon me, intermingled with a feeling of being um, suffused with a quiet strength. I lay down on the bed and slept like a child. An hour later, I awoke to a new world. Nothing had changed and, changed, and yet everything had changed. The scales had dropped from my eyes and I could see life in its proper perspective. I had tried to be the center of my own little world, whereas God was the center of a vast universe of which I was perhaps an essential, but a very tiny part. It is well over 16 years since I came back to life. I have never had a drink since. This alone is a miracle. It is, however, only the first of a series of miracles that have followed one another as a result of my trying to apply to my daily life the principles embodied in our 12 steps. I would like to sketch for you the highlights of these 16 years of a slow, but steady and satisfying upward climb. And if you wanna read the rest of that story, it's called The Man Who Mastered Fear, page 251. So we'll just stop the recording there. Just bear with me. There we go.